Okay, uh, let's open our Bibles and uh, let's read our text for today. As you can see on the screen behind me today, God willing, will be the last few verses that we study in Paul's first of two letters to the Thessalonians. Starting in verse 25, we read Paul's concluding words to them. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is God's holy, inspired, authoritative word of truth. And all of God's people said, Amen. Okay. Well, like I said, God willing, <laughs> today we will be concluding this most wonderful letter, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Now, some of you may be asking, Andrew, where do we go next? Well, we go to Paul's second letter <laughs> to the Thessalonians, right? And we will be doing that uh, next time. Now, today, uh, we're going to be taking a look at Paul's concluding requests to the believers in that church in Thessalonica. And there are three things we're going to see. Number one, we're going to see in verse 25 where Paul asks them, actually commands them, to pray for him and others who had been serving with him, in particular, Timothy and Silas. That's intercession. And then we're going to see in verse 26, Paul commands them to continue to love each other. That's affection. So we have intercession, we have affection, and then in verse 27, we are going to see Paul uh, strongly binding them in an oath where he wants them to read the word, the letter, that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote to them. That's submission. So again, Paul concludes this letter saying, hey, pray for us. Hey, love each other. Hey, make sure you read this letter out loud to the entire congregation. And so let's take a look at verse 25. Again, we know our context. Paul had planted this church uh, along with uh, uh, his missionary partners who were with him, Silas and, and Timothy, and probably Luke was there as well. And we know that Paul had probably stayed in Thessalonica, northern part of Greece, in the region of Macedonia. He probably stayed there about four to six months. Glorious church was planted. Uh, Paul was, you know, evangelizing them, discipling them. I mean, you can imagine how great that church was. Young church, but boy, think of who their pastor was, the Apostle Paul. Well, unfortunately, like what usually happened with Paul, <laughs> the angry mob in the city turned against him, kicked him out of town. Eventually, Paul made his way down in the, to the southern part of Greece in the region of Achaia in the city of Corinth, where he was ministering there. And Paul really wanted to know well, what happened to his beloved Thessalonian believers. Again, Paul's down south in Corinth. They're up north in Thessalonica. Were they okay? Did the mob turn, you know, against them? Was there still a church there? How were the young believers doing? And so Paul had dispatched Timothy to check on them and to bring back a report. And again, as we know, Paul or Timothy brought back a glorious report about that church. Uh, church was still there. Believers were strong in the faith. Yes, they were being persecuted by the non-believing mob there, but nevertheless, they were firm in their faith. Why? Because that was a truly regenerated church. They were in Christ. 
right? And so when Paul received this report, he was so excited. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote this first of two letters to the Thessalonian believers. Remember our um, kind of calendar? of Paul wrote 13 letters in the New Testament. His first letter was the letter to the Galatians. His second letter was this letter, 1 Thessalonians. His third letter was 2 Thessalonians. And that's why we're going to, after we finish this letter today, we'll next time pick up and start on 2 Thessalonians. And so throughout this letter, Paul was so filled with joy. Paul was um, uh, defending some of the false accusations that the angry mob had leveled against him as to why he left and as to why he didn't return to his beloved believers. So Paul dealt dealt with that. Paul also dealt with some um, questions that the young believers had, in particular uh, referring to uh, the return of the Lord, the day of the Lord. Um, And as Paul here is concluding his letter. He's just making some concluding requests here. And in verse 25, Paul says, Brethren, pray for us. Underline the word pray. Pray for us. It's actually not a a simple request. It's a, a present imperative, meaning, hey, I'm strongly urging you, strongly requesting you, even commanding you, to pray for us and to pray for us continuously. Now, two early manuscripts will include the word also to that verse. Brethren, pray for us also. Now, chances are your version doesn't include the word also, but if you look in the margins, you'll see that um, uh, it refers to two early manuscripts that have it. Why am I saying this? Well, you look at Paul's humility here. Again, he's the great Apostle Paul, right? He was their pastor. These are young believers. And Paul is saying to them, hey, could you pray for us? I mean, think about this. In this letter, Paul kept telling them how he was praying for them. In fact, just hop over to chapter 1. We see how Paul opens this letter. In verse 3, uh, verse 2, I'm sorry, he opens the letter by saying, We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. Paul opens this letter telling the young believers, hey, we're praying for you. I mean, can you imagine when they would have heard that after this letter was read? Boy, the comfort, the joy. Hey, even though Paul's not here with us physically, he is praying for us constantly. In fact, just hop over to chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. Halfway through this letter, Paul just breaks out in a prayer for them. He says, now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. Paul wanted to go back and visit them. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people. Just as we also do for you. So that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So Paul starts out his letter telling them, hey, I'm always praying for you. We're always praying for you. Halfway through this letter, Paul breaks out into prayer for them. And then at the end of the letter, chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, the section we studied last time, Paul concludes this letter by praying for them. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you. He will also bring it to pass. Paul starts out the letter. We're praying for you. Halfway through the letter, Paul prays for them. 
At the end of the letter, Paul prays for them. And then in verse 25, he says, brethren, it's, it's an emphatic. It's, it's, it's showing his deep love for them. Brethren, pray for us also. I'm praying for you. Pray for us. And again, you see Paul's humility here. I mean, he's an apostle, an apostle of Jesus. They're young believers. And yet Paul doesn't kind of say, well, you know, your prayers really don't matter or aren't going to help me because I'm the great apostle. No, look what he says, I'm brethren. Pray for us. That's intercession. Lift us up in prayer to the Lord. We need it. And every pastor needs it, right? I know as a pastor, I'm always praying for you. And I have to tell you that the great joy I have is when I hear people in the church saying, hey, pastor, I prayed for you today. I prayed for your wife, your mother. But it really just fills my heart with joy. Andrew, we're praying for you. Very often I'll get a text and you know, someone will say, hey, just thinking of you, praying for you. Boy, I tell you, that really just blesses my soul. In fact, the great Charles Spurgeon, um, you know, had a massive church, a huge ministry, um, you know, considered the prince of preachers. And um, he was asked by somebody, you know, how is it you attribute like all this growth and all the success and how is it you can deal with all that you're dealing with and you still have joy? And you know what Spurgeon said? My joy is that I know that my people are praying for me. That's a church. The shepherd, shepherds, pray for the sheep. And the sheep pray for the shepherds. So Paul's first request, it's an imperative. Pray for us. That's intercession. Number two, verse 26, Paul says, greet, you can underline greet, that also is an imperative, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. You see what Paul is saying? Not only, hey, pray for us, but also love each other with a holy kiss. Now, let me explain that to you. Um, Back, back during the time of Paul, um, an inferior would kiss a superior, maybe on his foot, maybe on his hand, maybe on his elbow, right? Because that was an inferior showing respect and honor to a superior. But when somebody would kiss somebody on the cheek, right, especially in the early Christian church back then, that was considered in that culture one of the greatest signs of affection, which makes, by the way, Judas's betrayal of Jesus even more heinous. He betrayed Jesus there in that garden. How? with a kiss. Well, back during the time of Paul and during the time of the early church, Christians, when they gathered, would often show their affection to each other in that congregation by a holy kiss on the cheek. 
In fact, Justin Martyr, one of the early church fathers, by the way, his last name was not Martyr. He actually earned that name, how? By being martyred for his faith in Christ. Justin Martyr writes that this was a regular practice during the Lord's Day services in the early church. In fact, during the time of the Lord's Supper, which they celebrated every service, um, they would have a time of just embracing each other with a holy kiss. Now, again, it was culturally appropriate. People understood that it was a sign of great affection. There was, you know, nothing, um, you know, uh, sinful or um, uncomfortable about it. Now, eventually that practice stopped somewhere around the 13th century. And ever since then, um, you know, Christians have shown affection to each other, um, you know, in the most culturally appropriate way. For some, it's handshake, right? Others, it's a, it's a hug. Still others, it might be a kiss on the cheek, forehead, whatever it may be. Paul's idea, what Paul is saying here to the church is, hey, pray for us. Continue to show love and affection to each other. Now, again, remember, we've learned this church was a loving church. In fact, let's just go back to the beginning of the letter, just as a quick reminder. In chapter 1, Again, verses 2, and now let's add 3. Paul says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, meaning that they had a true saving faith that actually was manifesting itself in good work, showing the evidence that they were truly regenerated, saved by grace alone. He said, We constantly bear in mind your work of faith and your labor of love. This was a church whose faith was working. This was a church whose love was laboring. You know, it's easy to, you know, greet somebody with a holy kiss, <laughs> right? When, you know, you get along with them, you have a close relationship with them, um, you don't really have a lot of disagreements with them. But it's another thing to show up into church and, you know, kind of like uh, so-and-so, whatever, whatever, and can you still show affection to your brother or sister in Christ? Can your love labor? In fact, over in chapter 4, Paul again talks about their incredible love for each other. He says to them in verses 9 and 10, Now as to the love of the brethren... You have no need for anyone to write about you. He goes, let me talk now about the love, you, the affection you guys show in, in the church there in Thessalonica. He goes, no one really has to say anything about that. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, for indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren, not only in that church in Thessalonica, but all who are also in Macedonia, northern part of Greece, the church in Philippi, the church in Berea. This was a loving church in Thessalonica. But Paul said to them, but we urge you, brethren, excel still more in showing love and affection to each other. And that's why, back to chapter 5, verse 26, Paul says to them in his concluding request, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. By the way, all would include, remember we learned about some people in that church, verse 14? They were unruly, out of line. Back to verse 26, when Paul says, greet all of them with a holy kiss, I guess that would include even the unruly who were in the congregation, right? Not to say that, you know, they were to ignore their sins or their unruliness. They know they needed to get them back in line, admonish them. But nevertheless, show love and affection to your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's the Lord's house. You're there with the Lord's people on the Lord's day. Show the love of the Lord 
to his people, right? And so, Paul says to this congregation, as he concludes this letter, hey guys, pray for us. Remember, you, in this letter you've seen, we're praying for you. Number two, hey guys, love each other. You're doing it. And I'm so impressed with how your love is laboring, but I want you to excel still more. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Show affection. And then number three, in verse 27, he says, I adjure you by the Lord. Adjure you in the Greek. Uh, the word is enor kidso. It literally means I bind you under oath. Boy, that's pretty serious. I adjure you. I bind you under oath, Paul says, by the Lord to have this letter, what? Read, underline read, to all the brethren. Paul not only wanted them to pray for him, to love each other, but Paul also wanted them when they receive this letter from Paul, again, he's down in Corinth, they're up in Thessalonica. Paul said, I want you, I adjure you to have this letter read to all the brethren. Obviously on the Lord's Day when everybody was gathered together, right? And the Greek word for, for read, have this letter read, is anagnothenai. It carries the idea of not only just reading it, but to read it publicly, out loud. Now, why would Paul say this to them? Well, maybe Paul was um, maybe a bit concerned that, again, <laughs> the relationship Paul had with those Thessalonian believers and the relationship they had with Paul was a very special one. Again, he hadn't been with them that long, maybe, again, four to six months before he was booted out of town. But nevertheless, a strong bond was formed. And maybe Paul was concerned that when they received this letter from Paul and Paul wasn't there, you know, he didn't deliver it, Maybe they would have been disappointed, let down. I don't know, maybe they would have maybe ignored the letter or maybe not been as zealous to share it with the congregation because maybe they would have been disappointed that their pastor, you know, still was away from them. And again, we're not 100% certain, but nevertheless, Paul, you know, binds them by oath. Have this letter read publicly, out loud, to everybody. And again, you have to understand, we've been studying 1 Thessalonians, right? And we're trying to understand the original context, and we're looking to see how the principles in that original context apply to us as well today in our context, right? But back then, at this point, the New Testament wasn't yet complete. In fact, it was being inspired by the Holy Spirit, you know, through the apostles and other writers whom the Holy Spirit had, had chosen. So, you know, you've got a young church in Thessalonica, their pastor was taken from them. Um, how were they supposed to function? How were they supposed to handle, okay, unruly people in the congregation? How were they supposed to deal with the questions they had about the return of the Lord and the day of the Lord? How were they supposed to deal with, I mean, everyday church issues? This letter. This was a 
a revelation from heaven for them, right? In that original context. Paul was addressing real-life situations that they were dealing with. Again, chapter 1, Paul was praising God for them. He was telling them how, how thankful to God he was because that their faith was so firm. Chapter 2, Paul was defending himself to them in this letter because of false accusations that the angry mob had made up about Paul. Hey, your guy Paul, he just, you know, showed up here. He was looking for money. He was trying to woo some of the women. Uh, if Paul really loved you, why would he not return? Paul's a phony. Paul's a fraud. Well, how was Paul going to defend himself? This letter. Again, you know, um, Paul needed to answer their questions about the return of the Lord, the day of the Lord. Paul needed to talk to them about the relationship of pastors to the people and people to the pastors. Paul had to talk to them about dealing with unruly people, people in the congregation who were stepping out of line, people who were faint-hearted, people who uh, you know, needed, to be, needed courage, maybe who were confused doctrinally. So this letter obviously is a living letter to living people back then dealing with real life issues in a real church back then. And so this was their instruction from heaven. And so it was very important for this letter to be read out loud. This was scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit written by Paul or somebody, uh, Manuensis, who wrote it as Paul spoke. And Paul wanted to make sure, even if they were disappointed that he wasn't the one who delivered the letter, Paul wanted to make sure this letter was read. Because again, it was a revelation from heaven to them. Right? And that's why he adjured them, put them under a solemn oath. Read this revelation from heaven. Read it publicly. Read it out loud. And can you imagine the people in the congregation? When they heard, right, as the, you know, one of the elders or several of the elders were reading this letter out loud? Can you imagine, like, right at the beginning when they heard, hey, Paul's praying for us constantly? Wow. He hasn't forgotten us? Can you imagine when they got to chapter 2 and they started to get some of their questions answered that based upon the accusations that these this angry mob was make, saying about Paul, and they go, aha, uh -huh, now I get it. It's not true what they're saying about Paul. Listen what Paul's saying in this letter to us. Imagine chapter 3 when Paul breaks out in a prayer to, for them and, and prays to God because of them. And, and can you imagine how encouraged they were? And then imagine in chapters 4 and 5, Paul talks to them about the return of the Lord. Aha! Now that makes sense. The day of the Lord. Oh, okay. I get it now. And then here at the end, when they're in the, listen to the letter, come to, to, to the end, and, and they, they, they hear Paul saying, hey, pray for us. You imagine people in the congregation going, you believe it? Paul's asking us for prayer, for intercession? Absolutely, we're going to pray for Paul. Did you hear what Paul said about greeting each other with a, with a holy kiss, showing even more affection? Man, that, yeah, we, you know what? We've been maybe, we've ignored a couple of those people who have been a little unruly. We, we need to show affection to them. You know what? Right after this letter's read, right after this service, you know what? I'm going to go and put my arm around that person and just, and just tell that person I care for them. And maybe pray with that person. You, you see? So that's why it was so important for this letter to be read. And that's why today, 2,000 years later, this is what we do, right? Right? 
we first, whenever, whatever text we're studying, I read it out loud, right? So you know what we're going to study today. I then take the time and I expound it for you, explain it to you. I try to put you into the original context. I interpret the main text with other texts in Scripture to, you know, allow the Holy Spirit to give you more clarity and illumination. We come back to the original text and we dig in deeper and dig in deeper. This is what faithful pastors and true churches of Christ have done for the last 2,000 years. So we always read the text out loud. We then learn the text together. And once we understand that which God meant by that which God said to them in their context, once we understand that, we then take the principles and apply to our lives today, right? I mean, there's nothing worse when, you know, a guy stands up and he never reads the text, so the people have no idea, you know, what, what's being taught, spoken about or taught. He never explains the text, so they have no clue, <laughs> you know, the original context, original language, and so forth. It's just, he tells stories, maybe he'll pick a verse out of the air for here, jam it in, another verse here that's unrelated, jam it in, and it's nothing. It's impotent. And so, Paul wanted the people to not only pray for him, to not only show love to each other, but he also wanted them to show love to the Lord by reading the inspired word of the Lord and submitting to that which was read, explained, and learned. And to be honest with you, I look at Paul's concluding request and I say, well, that's a church, right? A church where, again, the shepherds are praying for the sheep and the sheep are praying for the shepherds? That's a church. A church where, you, where intercession is the norm. A church where people love each other. That doesn't mean you're not going to have disagreements and all. Of course you will. But there's true affection. First and foremost, affection to the Lord and affection for the Lord's people. All of the Lord's people, including those who may be a little bit unruly at times, right? That's a church that's laboring in love. Love towards the Lord, love towards the Lord's people. A church that, that makes people feel warm and welcome in a culturally appropriate way, in an obviously Christian way, where people just feel like, wow, this is a family. Well, isn't that what Christianity is? It's the family of God, right? So a true living church of Christ is a praying church. It's a loving church. And it's a church that studies the Word of God and submits to the Word of God. It is a church that eagerly anticipates every Lord's Day to hear from the Lord because we have the mind of the Lord, the Holy Scriptures. We're not interested in stories. We're not interested in, you know, exegeting the culture. We're not interested in the latest fad. We are interested in having somebody read the word out loud and then explain the word in the power of the Spirit where Christ is exalted to the glory of the Father. We are interested in hearing from heaven. That's a church, right? Right? 
because a church like this is a church that is worshiping the Lord. Deeper you go in your understanding of the word, higher you go in your worship of the Lord, right? The more you understand what the Lord wants of you as a Christian, especially when it comes to your brothers and sisters in Christ, right? So Paul concluded this letter asking them to pray for him, to love each other, to read the word and understand the word. This letter. And then here in verse 28, Paul concludes this letter by saying, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I love that. Again, true church. Praise for, you know, <laughs> it's a praying church. It's a loving church. It's a, it's a, Submissive church to God's holy word, and it is a church that is empowered by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. A church that is sustained by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. A church that understands grace. Like Paul did, right? I mean, interesting. Just hop over again to chapter 1. Look how Paul opened the letter. Verse 1, and he says the letter's coming from Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Who's the, church, who's the letter going to? To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the saved church. And look how Paul opens this letter to them. Look at his greeting. Grace to you in peace. I love that. He starts the letter talking about grace. Back to chapter 5. Verse 28, he concludes the letter. How? Talking about grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I love that. In fact, you just can take a look at Paul's letters in the New Testament. You will see this common theme throughout. He opens his letters talking about grace. He concludes his letters talking about grace. Throughout his letters, <laughs> what does he talk about? Grace. Paul preached the gospel of grace. That was Paul's gospel, actually, because it's God's gospel, right? The gospel of grace. And Paul, you know, you think about it. Why, why is it that Paul was always talking about grace? Well, <laughs> my question is, why would you want to talk about anything else, right? <laughs> the grace of God, right? But Paul was, boy, I tell you, Paul really understood grace. And Paul was just continuously blown away by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Why do you think? Why do you think Paul just could not get over <laughs> or get past the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll tell you why. Let's hop over to Galatians real quick. I want you to see something that hopefully will help you understand. Every time you read a letter from Paul, you look at his greeting and you see grace and you see his conclusion of the letter, grace. I want you to see why. This is Paul's first letter, right? To the Galatians, okay? Churches he had planted during his first missionary journey. And Paul opens this letter, and here in verses 13 through 16, Paul explains to the young Galatian believers who he used to be and how he used to be before he had been saved. He was Saul, the Pharisee of Pharisees. And look how he describes himself. Verse 13, he says, you, heard, you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism. How I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure. And I tried to destroy it. Paul? was a terrorist. 
so to speak, right? He was persecuting Christians. He was trying to destroy Christians in Christ's church. Terrorist. This is what Paul says about himself. This is who I used to be. He says, you've certainly heard about my former way of life. How I persecuted and tried to destroy the church of God. Verse 14, he was exceptional at this. He said, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Paul said, I was on the fast track of pharisaical success. Thinking I was pleasing God, even though I was trying to destroy the church of God? I was so zealous. I was advancing past my contemporaries. I was on the fast track to pharisaical, albeit hypocritical, success. This is who Paul used to be. A persecutor of Christians. One who tried to destroy the church of Christ. What happened? Verse 15, look at the first three words. But when God. Do you see it? <laughs> but when God. Uh, Paul wasn't, Saul, wasn't looking to be saved by Christ. Saul wasn't, uh, you know, checking out and trying to figure out maybe Christ. And No. Paul made it clear who he used to be and what he was doing. But when God, do you see it? But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb. That's your, there's your doctrine of election right there, right? And who had called me through his grace. Called me to salvation. How? Through his grace. I mean, you think Paul understood grace? Right? Again, he's, he's on the road to Damascus, northern, above Israel, north of Israel, looking to destroy the church of Christ there. Looking to persecute Christians, force them to blaspheme. He was a violent aggressor. But on that road to Damascus, what happened? But when God, <laughs> you see it? <laughs> Who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace. Paul understood. He was saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Again, you can read Paul's conversion story. Go to Acts 9. Uh, Paul wasn't looking to be saved. Paul didn't think he needed to be. Or if, if, as a Pharisee, he thought he could do it on, through his ancestral traditions, right? Paul wasn't looking for Christ. He wasn't, quote, seeking, unquote, Christ, because nobody does, because we're all dead to, to God, right? We come to this world with a sin nature. We're dead to God. We want nothing to do with God. We're hostile to God, just like Saul was. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me. Do you see? It was all of God. So that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I love this. Why was Paul constantly talking about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Because Paul understood the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? He had been chosen for salvation before the foundation of time. God had set Paul apart before he had become Saul, before he was even born. And Christ went to the cross 
to pay for the sins of this wretched sinner. And God the Holy Spirit drew this wretched sinner to Christ, regenerated Paul and gave him the gift of faith to be able to repent of his sins and place his faith and trust in Christ alone. And he went from being a persecutor of Christ to a preacher for Christ. He went from being a violent aggressor opposed to Christians. He became an apostle of Christ loving and serving and praying for Christians. How do you explain this? But when God, do you see it? It's all grace. And Christian, that's our story also, right? We had no clue that, that we were separated from God. I mean, we knew something wasn't right and we, we tried all kinds of things to ignore it or maybe to try to make it right, but Scripture says we came into this world separated from God because of the sin nature we inherited from Adam and Eve. A sin nature that caused us to live in rebellion to God. We were hostile to God. Maybe you didn't do the same exact thing that Saul had done before he became the Apostle Paul. But nevertheless, you wanted nothing to do with God. Scripture says we were enemies of God. And we were under the just judgment of God. We were on a highway to hell. And whether we felt something wasn't right in our relation with God or just completely tried to drown out that feeling and that knowledge in various different ways. Nevertheless, the fact of the matter is we were all on a highway to hell, just like Paul was, Saul was. And there was nothing we could do. I mean, look at Saul. He was a Pharisee. He was just climbing that ladder. You know, a Pharisaical success. Religiosity. I didn't save him. And all the stuff we had tried, nothing saved, could save us. How is it we're saved? But when God. Do you see it? <laughs> I love that. But when God. God the Holy Spirit and His grace regenerated us, made us alive in the spiritual realm, gave us the gift of faith to go, oh, I'm a, I'm a sinner who has, is in big trouble. I, I have sinned against a holy, righteous, and pure God, and He's just, and oh my goodness, I, I've earned damnation. God, please forgive me of my sins. Not only am I a sinner, I'm in desperate need of a Savior, and God was pleased by His grace to reveal His Son to you. And of course, you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you cried out for saving grace and mercy and forgiveness and God in His grace saved you. Brought you into His family. You're a child of God forever. Not on a highway to hell. In a living real relation with the God of this universe where you will spend eternity with Him. How did this happen? God's grace. And that's why God gets all the glory. Right? Again, we're saved by grace alone. I mean, you think Paul had a problem with that? Come on, look what he wrote. He knew who he was. He knew how he was. And he knew that he didn't contribute to his salvation. He was saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that's how every person is saved, right? And Paul was so blown away by God's amazing grace. 
That's why he always talked about it, wrote about it, right? Again, uh, our letter, 1 Thessalonians, as we conclude, in chapter 5, he starts out, verse 25, saying, Brethren, pray for us. Verse 26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Verse 27, I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. And then in verse 28, Paul concludes this most glorious letter, his first to the Thessalonians by saying, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He starts the letter <laughs> talking, you know, offer, you know, offering grace to them, talking to them about the grace of our Lord. And he concludes this letter the same way. And Christian, don't ever get tired of hearing about, talking about, and rejoicing in God's grace. Again, just meditate on those three words. But when God. Whoa, right? And here we are now, like those Thessalonian believers, part of God's family. Man, we want to pray for each other. We want to show affection to each other. We want to together hear the word of the Lord and submit to the word of the Lord. And we want to, to get together rely upon the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, you are who you are all by His grace. Christian, make sure your life gives Him all the glory. Amen.